And by joy, we get this word, meaning the Shekinah, or the glory of God. That's where the word joy comes from. So anytime you have joy, obviously you are standing in or somehow in the presence of God, because that's where it emanates from. Joy is not part of the human creature. Uh, it is shared with the human creature from God, but it is not part of the, the human creature. Humanity strives for happiness. And happy stems from the word which means circumstance. So if you want to lose 50 pounds and you lose 60, what are you? You're happy. <laughs> you're standing in front of that mirror and you're going, yeah, it's all about me. Because you did it, right? You worked, you exercised, you dieted, and then you went to Crystal Burgers. And then 70 pounds came back on. And what happened to your happiness? Well, it's gone. Why is it gone? Well, because the circumstance changed. And that's where the word happy comes from. It means uh, a temporary setting or a temporary circumstance. So if you can spend your whole life and all your energy trying to keep your circumstance good, then you'll probably end up being a happy man or a happy woman. But if your life is a disaster and the circumstances are hard and you're a slave in a foreign country or things like this, then God's got to intervene. And God will intervene and he promises his joy. In fact, some of the last words Jesus said is, I'm going to leave you my joy so that your joy may be made full. Jesus didn't say I'm gonna make circumstances change. He didn't say, I'm going to make you happy every day the rest of your life. He said, I'm going to give you my joy, my presence, my uh, well-being for your life, regardless of the circumstance. This is where Paul says, you can rejoice, same word, even in your persecution. Because that will bring about proven character. What does that mean? Well, that means that you know you can get through anything as long as God's by your side. And as long as God's by your side, then the circumstance takes a lesser place in your life. And that's what we're talking about. The difference between that which is of God or that which is of man. A lot of people say, oh, I'm happy, I'm happy. And then the next week they're diagnosed with some horrible disease. And then suddenly what happens to their happiness? No, oh, I'm not happy anymore. My wife is dying. I'm not happy anymore. Or my husband, my kid, whatever. I'm not happy anymore. Why? Same kid as you had yesterday, right? Same wife as you had yesterday. You were happy then. Why aren't you happy now? Well, the circumstance changed. And now you're bummed out and you're ready to throw yourself off a building. The Lord says, no, you're no longer of this world. You're over, you've overcome the world. I've overcome the world. Jesus said that a number of times. Therefore, who and or what can stand against you if I am with you? Nothing. Okay? Well, if you can develop this kind of joy, which is holy and completely of the Lord, then how can we employ it in our lives? Well, last week we saw just uh, joy in being alive. Chapter 1 was joy in living. Every day. You know, there's been a lot of places and a lot of circumstances where people were just happy to get a little crust of bread every day. And if they got that little hunk of bread, they were living large. You and I would look at that little hunk of bread and go, oh, that's nothing. But to somebody who's never had it, and as far as they know, will never get it again, for them to be given a little hunk of bread to eat, well, that's incredible. That's joy in living. Just day to day, I got up. You know what happened this morning when I woke, opened my eyes? I found that I was still breathing on a regular basis. My muscles worked, my joints worked, well, some of them. 
And the Lord told me a very special message this morning when I woke up, when I regained consciousness, when I became an sentient being again from dream world to real world. He said, Tom, you're breathing, right? Your eyes are open, right? You are aware of the surroundings, right? Now I want you to go and be joyful. This is the day I have made. I want you to rejoice in it. I don't want you to be happy. I want you to rejoice in it. Well, what does that mean? That means, chapter 1, I want you to find joy in everything. When you talk to Raja, joy. I already had a laugh this morning. I mean, I got Cougar Raja coffee. Who knew? And it's right there in our machine. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I drink this. It's not any better than our coffee. <laughs> but it makes me want to dance. <laughs> Feel the rhythm. <laughs> I, can, I can honestly say I've never done this in a Sunday school class before. <laughs> Joy in living. Today, we're going to talk about another joy. Because if it is God's joy, then it's got to be everywhere and it's got to be not just in applied, but employed in every aspect of our life. Well, today we're going to talk about joy in service. How many of you get joy out of doing stuff around the church? You know, work day. Ah, let's have some fun. There's no fun in a work day. Sure there is. You know, let's teach Sunday school. Let's go to Bible study. Let's go see Tom in Sunday school. Is that fun? It is. Joy in service. Because service not only tells the world that you are being governed by a higher power, but it actually gives you the most beautiful or one of the most beautiful gifts of the world. What is it? Begins with a P. Sounds like a marine animal. Purpose. Purpose. <laughs> but you were close. <laughs> we just had we just had a little bit of joy, didn't we? <laughs> Service gives us purpose. I need to be at church today. Why? Because we're gonna make little garden tombs and I had to go dig up Tinner's backyard to get the sand. Where you think it came from? And then we got to put flowers in it and make the whole tomb thing for the little kids. Why? Will the little kids appreciate it? They'll have fun making it. You'll have fun helping them make it. And you'll walk away from this little children's thing today feeling good. Why? Well, because you were in the service of the Lord. Even better yet, we're not there yet, but sharing it with a third party. A bunch of kids. Purpose, meaning. Would your life have been easier if you didn't do it? Uh, be one less thing to do. But would you be richer for having not done it? No. Oh, what service can do. Look at chapter two. Starts off with a big old fat question. Two letters, if. If what? If there is to be any encouragement in Christ, think about this, encouragement in Christ, if it's going to happen, if there's to be any consolation of love, wow, if there's to be any fellowship in the Spirit of God, which is joy, if there's to be any affection or compassion between us, between one another, hmm, well, what, are, what should we do to achieve all those things? Well, you can make my joy complete. The joy which Paul received, he wants to share to everybody else. You can make my joy complete. How, Paul? How? By being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in the same spirit, and intent to fulfill one purpose. You can serve the Lord. 
Don't do anything from selfishness or empty conceit, what you're going to get out of it. But with humility of heart and mind, let each one of you regard one another, oh, listen to this, as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but for also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know what we're talking about? We're talking about joy in living and joy in service, working with one another so everybody can be benefited from it, not just you. Although Jesus existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Instead, he emptied himself and he took the form of a bondservant, one who serves, and being made also in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he therefore humbled himself by becoming obedient even to the point of death upon a cross. Therefore also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. And that name of Jesus, every knee will bow and those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is in fact the Lord to the glory of God the Father. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but even now, much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you. Joy in both all you do, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling and disputing that you may prove yourself to be blameless, innocent children of God, above reproach in the midst of a very crooked and perverse generation amongst whom you will appear as lights to the world. You're not chasing happiness. You're filled with joy. You're not empty and, and, and soulless. You have purpose and possession and possession. That possession is God himself. <clears throat> Hold fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may have cause for glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. Paul's purpose. But even as I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I still rejoice and share my joy with you all. And you too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I may also be encouraged when I hear of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who would genuinely, genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests and not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth and that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. So talking about Timothy helping Paul. Therefore, I hope to send him to you immediately as soon as I see how things will go with me. For I trust in the Lord and that I myself shall also be coming to you shortly. But I thought it necessary to send also to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need, because he was longing for you and, for, and was distressed because you had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick even to the point of death, but God shared mercy upon him, and not only on him but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly in order that when you see him again you may rejoice and I may be less concerned about you. Therefore receive him in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in very high regard because even coming close to death for the work of Jesus Christ risking his own life to complete all that was deficient in your service to me. Epaphroditus, almost history. 
but yet God had mercy on him and now he's got a job to do and that is to come amongst you and bring joy as Timothy also is being sent. Well, did those guys want to go to Philippi? Oh, by the way, Philippians is what one of what we call the prison uh, epistles. That means Paul was in jail. He was strapped up, bound by chains, uh, basically in a sewer is what they viewed, the Romans used as uh, prisons in those days. So that's why Paul's saying, I hope to come to you too, but right now I'm a little tied up, <laughs> so to speak. <clears throat> but I'm sending Timothy and I'm sending Epaphroditus. And they will complete in you what I wished I could complete in you. Your teaching and your study and the presence of joy. And they're going to do it gladly and joyfully, not out of sordid gain or you know, selfish uh, gathering of their own wants. Now, how many of us do that? Well, every day we go to work and we work hard, right, at our jobs. And at the end of the day, we expect to be paid for it. Well, is that joy in service? Well, we might be happy we got a job. And we're happy as long as we have a job. We may not like the job, but we're happy when we get paid for the job because then we can pay our bills and our responsibilities. Without which we would not be happy, right? It's all circumstance. But when we go to our jobs, are we happy more than just that we have the job? Are we happy to do what it is we do? See, that's the difference, I think, between the, different, uh, the difference between a job and a vocation. A vocation is something you do because you love doing it. A job is something you do because you got bills to pay at the end of the day, right? So are you living your life like a job? If you are, then you might be happy sometimes, usually on payday. If you're living your life as a vocation and you love to do it, that's a whole different ballgame, isn't it? People have asked me my whole life, Jenny, you really like this ministry stuff? Is that a job that you really enjoy? I said, I don't work in the ministry. Ask any of my parishioners, they'll tell you. I only work 20 minutes a week. But I love what I do. It's not like a job at all. And I've said it many times. I've said, it's like going to the sandbox to play. And there's all the construction stuff and you get to dig and build and stuff. I love it. I always have from the first day I took the pulpit until today, which has been about 45 years, folks. I enjoy it. I thought I'd run out of stuff to say, but I was wrong. <laughs> you guys are giving me stuff to say every day. In fact, I told John Haley that just yesterday. He said something stupid, and we were sitting there having lunch at Taste of Oviedo. And I looked at him and I said, you are just a big old fat bucket of sermon examples, aren't you? <laughs> he is. He really is. He really is. Which, by the way, if you go out there this afternoon, barbecue tents everywhere. You don't want that. You just don't want that. What you want? Carabas has a tent set up. And listen, all the barbecue places, you get this or that or whatever for two people, Carol and I, it's going to be about 30 or 40 bucks. But you go to Carabas, you got two choices. You can get the chicken brian, you know, the big hunk of chicken with the stuff all over it, the uh, sun-dried tomatoes and all that stuff. Or you can get the ravioli, the mezzaluna. Oh, that's a no-brainer. I'm ravioli boy. Careless chicken, chicken girl. We went out there, and I know the manager, and we were talking and everything, because Carol and I are there all the time. And he piled that ravioli up so high. Everybody else getting five or six of them. <laughs> yeah. And it was funny. And you get a free glass of something, too, but I can't say it at church. And you know what it costs for both of us? Ten bucks. Five bucks a piece. 
Something yummy that you would enjoy. <laughs> five bucks. I'm going five bucks a piece. When she said ten bucks, I thought she meant ten dollars a piece. Five bucks a piece. Two of us. Ten dollars? <coughs> yeah, wow. Then John, Mr. I Need Barbecue Boy, looked at that and said, What'd you pay for that? And I said, Ten bucks for both of us. And the free surprise. Well, John got the chicken, and sweet little Donna got the ravioli. I knew I should have married her. She's thinking with a clear head. John spilled it all over the front. <laughs> As did Carol. She spilled it all down her shirt. So I said, Donna, will you walk me out to my truck? Because I don't want to be seen with these two. <laughs> they look like homeless people. Anyway, that's just has nothing to do with chapter two of Philippians whatsoever. No. <laughs> but I'm trying to bring a little joy in your living. I was not I was happy when they said ten bucks, but I mean I mean that's quite a lunch. We sat down and we ate and we talked and had a blast. They got little sitter places everywhere with tents over them. And, out at the Oviedo Mall. You don't even have to go into Oviedo to have a taste of Oviedo. And, uh, and it has not new chapter two. But how many of us get joy in service? You know what? I'm going to tell you an amazing statistic, and you're not going to believe me, but I'm going to tell you anyway. This is 4%. Do you know what 4% is in terms of service? Say what? 4 out of 100. <laughs> <laughs> well, the math lady would tell me that. <laughs> Most of the work in any church is done by about 4% of the people in that church. <clears throat> Usually. And that's, a, that's pretty accurate across the board. Whether you have 10,000 people sitting there or whether you got 10 people sitting there. 4% of the people in church are actively involved in church, working hard. If there's a work day, they're there. If there's a job that needs to be done, they're there. If a class needs to be taught, they're there. Set up tables, take down tables, bring in chairs, bring out chairs. Anything and everything, 4% of the people you can rely on. Most pastors will say, yeah, oh yeah, I know her, she'll do it, or he'll do it. <coughs> this church, First Covenant, is considerably higher. And the reason is because these people have a working relationship with this God. More than just an intellectual knowledge. More than just saying, oh yeah, God and I are cool. I go to church. Well, a lot of people sit in church every Sunday, not to be judgmental, but they're as dead in their faith as an old rotten log. It's there. You got to step over it half the time or move it out of the way. But it's not really accomplishing anything. And you know who's the poorer for it? Most people say, well, gee, if we could get them moving and doing something, the church would be stronger and better. No, no. Who's the poorer for it? Well, they are. This is the 96 over here, and they get to church, and they say, boy, I hope Channer doesn't preach too long today. I hope he finishes by 12, so I can beat the Baptist to the steakhouse. Well, is that really radiating the joy of the Lord? Here is my chance to enter the kingdom of God, the house of God, to pray and to sing all to the glory of God, to help others in the name of God. And I can't wait to get out of here. <laughs> Think about it, folks. Why did you come in the first place? I can answer that. Just in case. Just in case what? 
you know, two weeks it'll be easier. I imagine our, we'll have a full house. A whole lot of people we ain't seen in a while. Why? Just in case. 4% in most churches. Now, I pride myself in the fact that I would say in this church, it's probably upwards of 70%. Maybe 60. 60 to 70, how about that? We need something done, we need help, we need whatever. Usually we'll have a pretty good crowd show up. And you know what used to cost us about 10 bucks at lunch to feed them all? Especially if we went to Carabas. Now I go out to get subs or sandwiches and it's 80 bucks, 100 bucks. But they're all there at the Lord's house working, sweeping, and washing, and cleaning, and rearranging, and emptying, and filling up, and everything that needs to be done. That's a good thing. You know why? Because that's what God wants you to be doing. And every time you do it, you walk away with a little bit more. That wasn't too difficult. That was kind of fun. I laughed with everybody, I ate with everybody, I cried with everybody, I became a part of it. Well, why do I feel like family? I feel like I'm a part of that church. A part of the church family. You know what? I need to be there just to make sure we're safe and strong. Really, you've taken ownership of your church. No, no. Well, you have, but you've taken ownership of who? Of you. And of this God that you profess. And you've done it in every little tiny means. You ever wonder why Jesus did so many things with his guys? You feed them. You heal them. You go get subs. You <laughs> go to Carabas. You ever wondered why they did so many things together? Jesus could have said, oh, I can heal these. I'll take care of it, fellas. Have it. Take a nap. <laughs> nope, he dragged those boys with him everywhere he went. He even got them involved many times in the Gospels. You do it. You go out. You and Philip go together. And don't be a nuisance. You guys go over here. You guys go over there. Why would Jesus do that? He's a son of God for crying out loud. He could snap his fingers and make anything. Who would you say was the strongest apostle? Most loyal to Jesus? Peter? John? No. Probably John. Well, you said his time. Yeah. <laughs> You've been watching The Chosen, haven't you? Peter walks around like this the whole time. Who does that, Peter? <laughs> Only him. You look at all the other guys, they're kind of lumping along, but not Peter. <laughs> I don't know where that character came from. I would say John. Almost every single event that happened in the gospel, who's right there in the front row? John. Leans his head against Jesus at the Last Supper. John. Was brave enough to ask the question, Lord, who will betray you? Will it be me? I think Jesus probably said, relax, John. No, it won't be you. In fact, you'll be the only one to go to Calvary and watch me die. John took possession of his Savior that day. And he never relinquished it. Never let it go. Even as an old man, broken in the sand on the beach, he asked God, Did I do okay? Did I do okay? God showed up and said, get out of, get up off the sand. Brushed him off. 
Prince John, I gotta show you something. You're gonna really love this. We're going to a taste of heaven. They got a big old Karabas tent there. And it's free. Who was the strongest apostle? Well, they argued who would be the greatest. And Jesus said, you want to be the greatest, do what? Be of service to everybody. And don't do it because you like Shirley Ashley. Do it because you love the Lord. She'll just be the recipient of your kindness. Don't do it because you like Racha. Do it because you love the Lord. And Racha will just be the object of your affection. Don't do it because you don't like Chuck. <laughs> Don't do it because you love the Lord. See what I'm saying? That's joy in living. That's waking up. That's totally individual. Joy in service is, hey, you're not an island. You're connected to any and everybody you ever meet. How many of you? You know, in, in a couple of months here, in June, I'm going to go to my 50th high school reunion. And none of the people that will be there will look like they did 50 years ago when I knew <laughs> The men will be bald and fat and the women will be perfumed and, you know, painted, <laughs> trying to regain that, gee, when I was gorgeous when I was 16, well, now you're 68 and you look like a bag of spuds. <laughs> but somehow, I hope, in some way, in the midst of that mixture of what was once great friends and beautiful, young, strong, impenetrable people are now old and kind of worn out a little and a little broken. And we're going to pick up where we left off and try and say, remember when we were just, <laughs> we were so awesome on that track team. We played football. We clobbered everybody. We were the basketball team. The girls, they were state champions every year in tennis. Florida state champions. We weren't a better team in the state except them. You know, we had Kerry Fleming. We had Laurie Fleming. We had Chris Everett. All these <laughs> names on our team and they could beat everybody. And you know what? They'll all get there and they'll all be old married women. And they will really relive those minutes again. And you know what they're saying to each other? They're saying, did we do good? That's what John said. He said, Lord, I did the best I could. Is it okay? And in the most remarkable miracle that God ever did, he took that little broken man and said, oh, John, come with me. Let me show you something really cool. And up he went. You think God answered his questions? He turned to him and said, John, I can depend on you. He didn't say that, but he's implying that. I want you to write these words, for they are faithful and they are true. And go back to my people in the churches who are suffering give them these words. I got one more job for you to do, John. And only you can do it. You're the last one left. Join service. Do you think John was God's disciple? Oh, yeah. Think John was God's apostle? Oh, let's change words. <laughs> yeah, you know what the difference between a disciple is and an apostle? One knows God, acknowledges God, and the other is sent to accomplish the purpose of God. That's the difference. Apostle means sent. Disciple means one of the, one of the boys, one of the guys. You get it? Be an apostle. And you'll be the better for it. All right, that's chapter two. Next week, uh, no, next two weeks, we won't have Sunday school. Next week is the picnic. And then after that is Easter. Is Easter, right? 
I've been writing like four sermons. I got them going at the same time, you know, because you got Easter early, you got Easter late, you got Good Friday, you got Palm Sunday. And then Roch is yelling at me saying, where's the stuff? I don't have the stuff. <laughs> this week was a little tense. So <laughs> having all of that going on, I, I got it to you late, but I got it to you. I get points, though, because I got it to you a lot of times on Tuesday and Wednesday. So I get one Friday every once in a while. She sends me these weird little pictures. Have you forgotten something? They're called GIFs or whatever, GIFs. They ain't no gift. They're some stupid little picture with a cat going. She sends them to me constantly. Did we forget something? about the three amigos. <laughs> this is what I got to put up with. <laughs> Every week. <laughs> I even tried to talk Racha to her. And I wasn't calling her a potato. I was calling her something else. A dead cat or something. I didn't know. I, I had the wrong word. Anyway. We got Racha coffee. And that's all that's important. <laughs> Let's get out of here. <laughs> <laughs>